Hello, I'm Josephine Burton, and welcome back to the Dash Arts Podcast, seeing the world through an artistic lens. Earlier in 2020, shortly before COVID hit the UK with such brutal force, we held a live event at Warwick Arts Centre dedicated to the novelist George Eliot. The cafe was part of Dash's European series, so we were exploring the role of the European and more widely the outsider in her writing. But really, it was a wonderful excuse to spend the evening with George Eliot as part of our R&D for a new adaptation of Middlemarch that I'm developing for Dash Arts with Ruth Livesey, Professor of 19th Century Literature and Thought at Royal Holloway University. Ruth and I were joined by writer Anna Lawrence, artist Riddell Olson and Martina Hall, producer of Gillian Waring's recent BBC Arena doc, Everything is Connected, George Eliot's Life. And we were serenaded by the fabulous music of Amy Kakura. As part of this podcast, we've pulled together an edited version of the live conversation, alongside a recent chat that Ruth and I had, catching up on the journey towards production that we've been on since the cafe and through the lockdown. I started the evening asking my guests to name their favourite Elliot novel. Ruth told me it was Elliot's first novel, Scenes from Clerical Life. We'll jump straight in to her answer. She decides to make her lead character, Amos Barton, the poor Reverend Amos Barton, who's described as the dullest man. The dullest man. In fact, he only stands out in his utter mediocrity, is her line. And I think, what amazing, what an amazing bold stroke for a brand new writer. And there's a review at the time that says, how dare she? How dare she make us read about these small people and then be interested in them? And and it's short, you know, and there is a value in, in getting people these days. Reading at length is really hard. And actually, I think there might be a value in going back to the shorter things. But really, it's Middlemarch. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm going to also say Middlemarch, unfortunately. And I'm going to say Middlemarch specifically for the evening because I reread Middlemarch last year and um, was just very struck. In our work at Dash Arts, we're thinking about identity and changing identity because of... um, uh, the refer- inspired by the referendum results and what, what that means to us in the UK. And I was just very struck by the role the outsider or the people, you know, or the role that kind of outside Middle March and, and Middle England work, you know, impacts on life in Middle Ma- March. And really was introduced to, to Ruth in order to explore that more, to talk about kind of the impact of the outsider on Middle March. And Ruth, as we will learn through the evening, has made me rethink this whole thing. So um, I, I hope that we'll, I hope we'll be able to talk about that during the evening. <laughs> um, but before we do, I would love to introduce Christina to give us a taste of some of her writing. She's going to read from Impressions of Theothrast as Such, which was George Eliot's last published writing. Sometimes, when I'm in a crowded London drawing room, for I am a town bird now, acquainted with smoky eaves and tasting nature in the parks, quick flights of memory take me back among my father's parishioners, whilst I'm still conscious of elbowing men who wear the same evening uniform as myself. And I presently begin to wonder what varieties of history the hidden uh, are hidden under this monotony of aspect. Here, perhaps, is a thought-worn physiognomy, seeming at the present moment to be classed as a mere species of wide cravat and swallow tail, which may once, like Faraday's, have shown itself in curious, dubious, embryonic form, leaning against a cottage lintel in small corduroys, not too much wearied, and hungrily eating a bit of brown bread and bacon. There, perhaps, a pair of eyes, not too much tired by the gaslight of public assemblies, that once perhaps learned to read their native England through the same alphabet as mine, not within the boundaries of an ancestral park, never even being driven through the country town five miles off, but among the midland villages and markets, along by the tree-studded hedgerows, and where the heavy barges seem in the distance to float mysteriously among the rushes and the feathered grass. Our vision, both real and ideal, has since then been filled with far other scenes. Among eternal snows and stupendous sun-scorched monuments of departed empires, within the scent of the long orange groves, 
and where the temple of Neptune looks out over the siren-haunted sea. But my eyes, at least, have kept their early affection of joy in our native landscape, which is one deep root of our national life and language. But I check myself. Perhaps this England of my affections is half visionary, a dream in which things are connected according to my well-fed, lazy mood, and not at all by all the multitudinous links of graver, sad, sad effect, such as belong everywhere to the story of human labor. I cherish my childish loves. The memory of, of that warm little nest where my affections were fledged. Since then, I have learned to care for foreign countries, for literatures foreign and ancient, for the life of continental towns dozing round old cathedrals, for the life of London, half sleepless with eager thought and strife, with indigestion or with hunger. And now my consciousness is chiefly of the busy, anxious metropolitan sort. My system responds sensitively to the London weather signs, political, social, literary. And my bachelor's hearth is embedded where by much craning of neck and head I can catch sight of a sycamore in the square garden. I belong to the nation of London. Thank you so much, Christina. So, so um, Ruth, can you paint us a um, kind of, draw a very kind of potted history of George Eliot from her nest to, you know, through to when, a point, I suppose, that she published this book. Yeah, I mean, I love this extract because this is Eliot at her most autobiographical in some ways, and it's typical of Eliot that she does it through this really complicated mouthpiece, which is this character called Theophrastus Such, who's supposed to be a crusty old literary man. But it's in that persona that she really talks about the context of, of her own life and affection for that Midlands landscape and the barge passing on the canal is, is something that Anna and I go back to all the time in our thinking about Eliot and her sense of place in a landscape full of canals and quarries. Um, so she's, she was born just outside Nuneaton at Griff House, as many of you know. Her father was a land agent of the wealthy Newdigate families, um, and they were a kind of aspiring up from the skilled working class into the middle class. It's a great trajectory of the 19th century, socially mobile, geographically mobile. And Eliot, in some ways, completely epitomizes that because she went from being the, as we've heard, the, 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 the plain girl of the family, to having this extraordinary career in which she was one of the richest women in England, thanks to her writing, um, renowned across Europe and the world for being, for her remarkable intellect. But it's a story of doubleness, and we can hear that here as well, that her fame and her money was built on writing these stories about remembering, remembering a small place, remembering home, remembering life in Nuneaton among the, the greens and the grasses and the canals um, that made her readers in a really dispersed, mobile world full of settlers and, and a kind of much more, a very global world in many ways. It, it, her, her literature gave people a, a way of feeling at home in that world through evoking a place that they might never have been to. And, and I love the, 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 the bit here that, that Christina drew our attention to. Perhaps this England of my affections is half visionary, a dream. And, and that's what she's showing. She's teasing us. Her. That's what literature can do. You know, it's very hard to go home again. In Eliot's case, she couldn't go home again. She really was, in many ways, as, as Theophrastus says here, in exile. You know, the question is why? There have been many voluntary exiles in the world since the first exodus of the patriarchal Aryans. And, and, and for her, it was a sort of voluntary exile, but her brother wouldn't speak to her again after she um, li decided to live unmarried with her great love, George Henry Lewis. Um, and he insisted that all correspondence went through solicitors after that point in time. And it was devastating to her. And she never really went back to her, her home territory. But in her letters to family and friends, she would evoke, ah, oh, you must have seen dear Griff House still standing there. So that sense of, of profound attachment to a place um, that made you, but that you've become a person who can't live there anymore. And that sense of being an outsider from your home is, is written through the fabric of so much of what she does. And I think that's why in stories like Middlemarch, which are about the idea of a, a city, a town based very much on Coventry, as we know, in the, in the, um, from sort of 1829 to 1832, she's, she's playing around with what looks like a really confined space, but showing how it's already moving, how it is in communication with the wider world. 
how outsiders are always going to come in and change it or be swallowed up by the city, and that's here. Yeah. And do you, I mean, my, my read of, of uh, I mean, I suppose Daniel Deronda and mm. also Middlemarch is very much that, um, you know, I'm projecting clearly, projecting a lot, but do, do in some ways that, you know, that she sees some, she has some empathy for the characters that have left. Is my is my oh. sense, and do you think that she saw herself as that person? You know, she yeah. she she she. You know, there was a lot that she gained from being out of the world from which she'd come. Yes, I mean, I, I, the, the, Daniel Durand is a really interesting book because, on the one hand, there's this whole passage saying pity poor Gwendolyn that she didn't have somewhere where she felt rooted, and she was one of these moderns who's always on the move. And yet, at the same time, we see the extraordinary career of someone like the Princess Alcarizi, what you can do as a woman on the European stage. So there's a real doubleness. I mean, there's a, a quotation from her letters I've got here. Um, after her father died, and she spent a long time, um, years in Coventry, caring for her father in his last illness in Bird Grove. Um, and a little bit of a legacy from him helped her travel for the first time to Europe and live in Geneva for a while. And then she came back and went to live back at Griff House with her brother for, for a little while. And this letter, <laughs> which is complaining about things that may sound a bit familiar, the dismal weather and the dismal country and the dismal people. It was some envious demon that drove me across the Jura to come and see people who don't want me. However, I am determined to sell everything I possess except a portmanteau and a carpet bag and the necessary contents and to be a stranger and a foreigner on the earth forevermore. This is great, like, tantrum flourished her friend Cara Bray and Coventry saying, don't, I cannot live at Griff House being the unmarried sister in my brother's household. And it's, it's a statement of cosmopolitanism. You know, I'm going to be rootless. I'm going to be free. I'm going to live out my carpet bag. Um, and so, she, yes, yeah, she, she embraced that opportunity. And, and in this letter, she asks about how much it would cost to rent a room down in London, and within a year, she's living in London, and that's her life. Right, so she's, she's embraced it as opposed to going out. I mean, you, cause the, I suppose to come back to that point yeah. again, I, my, my sense is that from the, from the characters is that they, there are some people who have gone out reluctantly into the world, but a lot of them, like, you know, they, they, a lot of them are bringing a lot, have gained a lot from it as an experience. Yeah, and, and Daniel Durand is a great one to mention because we've got Gwendolyn, who's supposed to be sad. Oh, how sad she's rootless. But then we've got Miss Arrowpoint, who falls in love with her music teacher, Herr Klesmer, um, who is one of my favourite understated small Elliot characters who's so important. And there's this wonderful bit of dialogue I can't um, resist sharing with you. Uh, at a, a, this is in the big country house. Miss Arrowpoint's a great heiress. Um, but she's clearly in love with her piano, with her music teacher, Herr Klesmer. And, and the stuffy old baronet who she's supposed to marry is, can't understand that she might be interested in this man. Um, and Miss Arrowpoint's trying to smooth over some argument. Herr Klesmer has cosmopolitan ideas, Miss Arrowpoint said, trying to make the best of the situation. He looks forward to a fusion of races. And, and Mr. Bolt, the rich man, says, I was sure he had too much talent to be a mere musician. <laughs> and there's this wonderful sense of actually, no, Miss Arrowpoint says, musicians, Klezmer says, we help rule the nation and make the age as much as any other public man. You know, that, that for Eliot, art is European or, or the world. You know, for her, her first entry into the world of art was through learning Italian and German from... Um, uh, Signor Brezzi, who used to get his pony carriage up from Leamington Spa once a week and come and give her, you know, Italian and German lessons. And then from there, she went and translated these huge worlds of world literature that made her famous globally. So it was, it was, a, it was a European world literature that she wanted to be part of, was hungry for. And of course, she, that also comes up in people like Lydgate, who got a lot of his radical, doc, radical kind of uh, medical training from outside that world and... So there wasn't just in the world of art that she was influenced. Yeah, but actually Lydgate's case is one I've been writing about recently and I find it really interesting because it, he reflects thinking, oh, it's difficult to tell it's the narrator or Lydgate's one of those slippery moments in middle March, but he's, the narrator's saying, do you, if you think it was ridiculous that Lydgate thought he, a doctor in a town like Middlemarch, could be a great discovery, think about Jenna. Think, and there's this whole list of, you know, think about Herschel. He taught people to play the organ in Sunderland and became this great discoverer. And the, the narrator in Middlemarch is really playing with an idea, I think, that Coventry and many Midland cities were the beating heart of an Enlightenment network of radical ideas. You know, Eliot got to meet Emerson, the great American transcendental philosopher, who was speaking at Leicester Mechanics Institute on his lecture tour. You know, there was a whole network of places beyond London in the early 19th century where intellectual life was thriving and where a provincial town like Coventry or Middlemarch where you had the agrarian landscape here, 
you had looms and all the technology of ribbon weaving, you had science and medicine and hospitals. It was a freer place for discovery and experiment. But I think there's something going on in Middlemarch that the, the narrator's also saying, hang on, but it's not like that by 1860, by 1870. It's become much more London-focused, much, much less free in that sense of where discovery and radical ideas can happen. So that's a that's a beautiful way, I suppose, to, to slightly move on because uh, as I was as I was continually told by Ruth when I kept saying, "Oh, the radicals are outside," she kept saying, "No, but there's so much there's so much there inside, and it's not about it's not necessarily about Lydgate or Casalban going off needing to not be inspired by the Vatican in order to come back. I mean, there was so much there on the ground in in Coventry and around you know Nuneaton and in Middle England, um, and not just radical exciting ideas, but also just a gorgeous world to, to inspire you. And I think Christina is going to segue, help us segue into, there she is. She's going to read a small section from Middlemarch. Thank you. The ride to Stone Court, which Fred and Rosamond took the next morning, lay through a pretty bit of Midland landscape. Almost all meadows and pastures with hedgerows still growing in bushy beauty and spreading out coral fruit for the birds. Little details gave each field a particular physiognomy, dear to the eyes that have looked on them from childhood. The pool in the corner where the grasses were dank and trees leaned whisperingly. The great oak shadowing a bare place in mid-pasture. The high bank where the ash trees grew. The sudden slope of the old mole pit making a red background for the burdock. The huddled roofs and ricks of the homestead without a traceable way of approach. The grey gate and fences against the depths of the bordering wood. And the stray hovel, its old, old thatch full of mossy hills and valleys with wondrous modulations of light and shadow, such as we travel far to see in later life and see larger but not more beautiful. These are the things that make the gamut of joy in landscape to Midland-bred souls. The things they toddled among, or perhaps learned by heart, standing between their father's knees whilst he drove leisurely. Thank you, Christina. It's a joyously beautiful passage and rich with texture and um, sound and, and, uh, and um, the world of the world of nature and it's a lovely opportunity for me to bring in Anna who with whom Ruth, Ruth really introduced me to Anna because they've been what you've been working together also on on George Eliot um, and do you want to talk a little bit about how what how that moves you or that inspires you that world Anna can you are you able yeah absolutely um I think for me one of the things about hearing that passage again um I actually find it incredibly moving um because I think we can really overlook I think Ruth, Ruth referred to and this kind of shift that I think is still happening now, which is that all the interesting stuff happens in London. And as someone born and bred in the back country on the other side of Birmingham who now lives in Solihull, that really irritates me, um, as I'm sure that some people in the audience will um, have experienced that as well. But I think more generally, kind of like moving away from that idea about the, the kind of uh, the, metro, the metropolitan centre and the, the, the provinces, just that thing about articulating how deep that experience is of knowing a landscape so intimately um, that, you know, whether it's as a child it's your walk to school or whether it's a back garden that you know really, really well. Um, that It's your... There is something about that relationship that makes that your place, that's your world, your experience of it. Um, and she evokes that, the universality of that very particular experience so beautifully... But the fact that she's saying it about this part of the world that does not get represented very well in literature. I mean, um, I'm just speaking of the other side of Birmingham. You know, the black country is reputedly called that because um, of, of how grimy it was. And, you know, everyone who looks into why it was called that talks about the fact that Queen Victoria pulled down the shades, required the shades be pulled down when she drove through in her train and all this kind of stuff because it was so ugly. And, 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 and uh, there is this kind of amorphous kind of thing about the Midlands. And uh, what I love is the way that, that Elliot kind of reframes this as she talks about the Midlands, but also about the centre of England. <laughs> and that, I can think, connects with what Ruth was saying about all of these, you know, um, the so much happening here 
I've kind of gone off my point a little bit now, but um, <laughs> the um, I think I think for me it's that kind of like it's a word that I heard, I've heard Ruth use a lot about Elliot, but that kind of granular attention to detail, um, and I really love that kind of it's it, she takes us there. So not only is it a kind of a an approach, a kind of a, a way of seeing that I really really value, um, but she does it in her writing too. So she's it, she's kind of kind of encouraging us to pay that kind of level of attention. And also just to value that experience. So to value the experience of knowing a place intimately and a small place really well. Um, and as someone who grew up in a small town, I think now it's only by revisiting it that I, I get that, um, that kind of resonance um, and that kind of sense of, of value of knowing a landscape intimately. Anna shared her fantastic short story, Quarry, written in response to George Eliot with us as part of the evening. We'll put a link to Quarry in the show notes for the podcast. After her reading, I turned to Martina Hall. I wondered if, Martina, if you could talk to us about the process that led Gillian Waring to, to the, the recent Arena documentary and why she was so drawn to the kind of the everyday life of, of the Midlands to depict her world. Um, well, I think it's something that's sort of very close to her own heart because she obviously comes from the Midlands herself. And um, if you're sort of aware of Gillian's work, she, she very much um, celebrates um, people, diverse people from all sorts of different types of worlds. So I think um, what happened was that, you know, obviously it was a bicentenary last year and um, the BBC wanted to do something about George Eliot, but they wanted to do something a little bit different and have an artist's interpretation of her work. So um, we approached um, Gillian and she was really, really immediately fascinated by it. So... Um, you know, she obviously knew George Eliot's work, but also to, I think it was that local connection um, that she really, really liked. And, um, you know, you, you were talking about Ruth, that sort of modern aspect that you get of, sort of, um, in George Eliot's work. And I think Gillian likes that. She liked coming to Coventry and Uneaton and seeing the modern and, and, you know, traditional sort of connections in George Eliot's work. And I think that's what she was very much wanting to do um, in the film. Um, and also have um, George Eliot's words read by a great different type of people, some people who were fans of George Eliot or people who had connections with buildings where she'd lived. Um, so it was a lovely organic process. I mean, we sort of started out finding readings that sort of, you know, told um, George Eliot's story, talking to people like Ruth and John Burton, who are here, and Catherine from the, from the museum, you know, who already had a connection. But then we also um, put out ads asking for people who, who like George Eliot. So, you know, the idea was to get you know, a completely different range of people, including people called George Eliot. So. <laughs> I think it was, just to, to chip in there, one thing that was so brilliant for, for me as an academic working on George Eliot, and, and it was great to hear Amy say this as well, it's the same story gets told again about Eliot all the time. And I know Catherine and John and Ali and so many people in the room have tried really hard to find a new way of telling the story of George Eliot that's not... She was incredibly intelligent and she was really ugly. You know, which, and, and, you know, I, I always hired, I've got someone great working with me, I almost hired her on the spot because she came in saying, those are the two things people think they know about George Eliot and we have to change it. Um, because, and, and Gillian's work and mm. what you did together seemed really important in shifting that story. Well, I think it was also trying to find modern connections because there were a lot of sort of stories, you know, people live, who'd lived in Fosal. Um, obviously, you know, recently and, and sort of connections and, and seeing what, what, brought, what people liked about her story, really, but to try and do something a bit different, and, I think. And did you find a lot of people who did have a connection? I think so. I mean, I hope so. I mean, as I said, you know, some, some things were more obvious than others and then we came across stories and, and what was interesting was, was you know, we, we talked to people who were doing readings and then they felt they had more connection by the end of it. You know, they, um, you know we, 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 we interviewed um, people who'd you know, who, who knew a little bit about her, but then as the process of the film, you know, found out more things. So I think that was really, really fascinating. I think for me, the most, well, well there's so much beauty and mm. it's, a, it's a gorgeous, it's a gorgeous piece of art as well as a, you know, fascinating insight into her and the museum and all sorts of places. I was very interested in um, George Eliot's, in, in, the, in what, what was George Eliot's house in Coventry, which has been turned into the Bangladeshi Cultural Centre. Yes, it's, that and, and and I when I you know Ruth and and, um, and I have been sort of talking about it a little bit and, and I'd heard that it wasn't particularly penetrable like you people you, know, you couldn't get in there and it was all closed up and it was barbed wire but you really got inside and and they loved talking to you and they loved they loved the idea of it being George Eliot's house I mean was that 
Can you talk a bit about that? Well, I mean, I think it it, it did take a bit of time and it was great because we had, you know, some people um, from the community who were really, really helpful in, you know, helping us get access. Um, And, you know, there were several visits to to go there. But again, you know, there were these these lovely connections and things that sort of just happened because we we went to film there on the day and um, we obviously were filming the people who, who owned the building and... Um, somebody who'd had lessons there and and then just completely by chance um, the gentleman who was there to let us in turned out to be a teacher who was a refugee who taught George Eliot who knew her work and that was this complete moment of serendipity and I think that was what was so wonderful that these connections sometimes happened almost organically and I think that was 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 great about it that you know it wasn't totally Gillian didn't immediately say we're doing this this and this it was quite a you know a, a, a long journey and I think that that was very refreshing for me because you know it's different working with an artist when you're making a film mm-hmm. television it's much more of a quicker process you have a certain amount of time and I think working with an artist it was more organic way of, of doing it and very rewarding and it was great. Is, is it, can you say anything else about that as a process? How why how why it's so different? Um, what well, was scripted I mean, in that scene? I think it, it, um, you know an artist just has a different way of seeing things and processing you know the way of telling a story. I think you know I think there have been fabulous biographies done in a more traditional way, but we wanted to do you know something slightly different. And you know I think she had obviously you know she's an amazing artist, so she had really interesting ideas of having two narrators, you know, in various things like that, I think that just made it very, very different, really. Um, and did you, did, did it give you a different perspective on George Eliot yourself? Because you, you'd obviously, you, you knew her work before. Did it shift the way that you understood her or you, you identified with her? Um, I think it, what was great about it was because it, so much of it was in her own words, you got much more of a sense of her and just how modern she was and just, just different, you know, little snippets, I think, you know, rather than just studying it as a, as a, as a sort of whole novel. Um, I mean, it was great because I think obviously we felt, um, you know, Gillian wanted to tell her story rather than doing an analysis of her work. So you'd get bits of, I mean, I hope people felt it did justice to the work, but, you know, I think we were very much wanting to tell the story of the woman and so one of the things I didn't realise was, you know, her sort of relationship with, with um, Lewis, which was such an amazing... I mean, they were these outsiders, but they were just seemed to be this little unit who actually had great fun together. I mean, it was an amazing love story of these two people who were outsiders. And I think that was, was sort of something that was very, very different. I didn't know, you know, all the places that you were saying that they travelled to, you know, and then they'd sort of, you know, we, we saw one of her sort of diaries and, you know, they had a great wine cellar. They, they obviously had a laugh, you know, they were obviously serious artists, but they, they'd found soulmates. And I found that incredibly sort of moving, really, I think. I think that's a beautiful point, Martina. And I, and I suppose to come back to you, Ruth, like my, my sense is that, that it, she, was not, she wasn't in permanent ostracised exile. She did find, and that must have changed the way that she felt about being out of her natural habitat, the fact that she'd found someone to share that experience with. Yeah, and, and I, she's, she's very interested in how we can make connections. You know, she kind of accepts that society changes all the time. That's what to be alive is to move and to uproot yourself and you've got to find ways to make new relationships, to build that web of connections. And it's lovely that the web of connections happened organically, it's such an Elliot phrase, for you, for you at Berg Grove that day. Um, so, so, like George Henry Lewis, her partner, she was very interested in the emerging field of psychology and how you can start to feel attached to a new place when you've uprooted for an old one. And the story of Silas Marner is completely about that. You know, Silas holds a little object in his palm once he's found Epi, and, and there's this amazing phrase of him growing into memory that he's, that he's suppressed, or the trauma of his, his shunning from his whole community has ruptured his life. But as he holds these familiar objects in his palm, you know, she's really thinking about what we'd now call like neural pathways reforming in his brain. So for her, the idea of being connected in webs is about reaching out and falling in love and exchanging letters and practical things. But she's also very interested in, in, in a very prescient way about the science of the mind and how, how we can make new pathways in our brain to, to relate to place and people through, through tiny things, as you're saying, through the tiny everydayness. This was a perfect moment to turn to Riddell to ask her her response to George Eliot. I'm really interested in the sense that the character that's being talked about in relation is someone who's reaching out, thinking about science, thinking about European ideas. 
I think it's really interesting to think how you can be informed by what's outside your locale and then work with it in relation to um, the way you find yourself making the piece of work. So I was very struck by that in relation to what you were doing with Gillian Waring in the sense of um, how she was working very much in relation to the juxtaposition between the text of George Eliot and then the close-up of the people who live there and then the, just the shots of the very mundane shots. So it's that juxtaposition of contemporary and historical and then local, but then reaching further that I think is really interesting. And is it inspiring? Is the, are those ideas inspiring your work, as a, your practice as an artist and filmmaker? Yeah, so I'm really interested in how you think about connections and networks and often trying to find... Um, I think we live in... Um, particularly in a sort of sense where we're not tracking where the things around us come from. Um, and maybe elements of that we start to do in relation to perhaps thinking about where our food come from, or where our food comes from, how it's sourced. But, you know, we might, might think further, like I'm sure lots of people in the room have mobile phones and you open up your mobile phone and often bits of that have been mined in Africa. Coal town is inside it. So what, what's the human labor? And I think this is something that George Eliot's really um, interested in. What's the human labor that goes into making those objects which we kind of take for granted in the everyday sense? Um, and I think what's interesting to me about George Eliot is the way that she's using lots of objects in the book, in, in, in the books, um, to almost m play metaphorically and then also, also play kind of symbolically with that at the same time as she's quite aware of their power, their symbolism, if they were to leave the domestic situation in which they might be, for example. So there's an amazing bit in Middlemarch near the end where the, um, where the, um, the, the auctioneer has, lo has a lot of little objects on a tray table. And I think there's a line that says something like, and these were just you know, the sum of vanity of, <laughs> vanity of human lives or something. Um, and it's that sort of sense of the commodities around us also, in a sense, determining who we are and being a kind of more sinister network. So I, I suppose, although I'm interested in the sense of the positivity of the networks of community, the relational aspects of things, I also think there are other ways in which we can look at the politics of those networks and how they're uh, set up through people doing things to other people and then the objects in our lives and thinking about wider issues of labor. Mm. That's really interesting. And in fact, I haven't shared this with you, Del, but it's part of the package you've done on Silas Marner for year nine that's on part of the project. We were talking about the jug in Silas Marner, which is one of those objects that Silas gets really attached to. And when it breaks, he makes a little shrine to it. And we were asking year nines to, to, to write a creative piece as if they were the jug writing about Silas Marner, because he becomes an object inside his loom and is explicitly you know, described as a man who's made by the objects in his life and, you know, and, and it's a lovely recursive way of thinking about it. Um, and, and, she, and, he do, and she does, she weaves her life back together, doesn't she, to, you know, to, you know, I suppose in her through her characters, but also through her own personal life. She managed to weave in the world, the world she translated, the world of her travels, the intricacy of her relationships back into the life that she loved. But I think I love the snags as well, that it, it was never straightforward, that yes, she... She got this great access to intellectual life and European life by translating uh, this monumental German work, Strauss's Life of Jesus, and it made her really famous, and it was a, a well-published translation. But when she was trying to skip the country subtly with George Henry Lewis, she bumped into someone who'd set up that translation on the train. Dr. Brabant bumped into them on the train, awkward. Wow. And then when they arrived in, I guess, Hamburg, um, off the ferry, he said, no, no, you never guess who's in the hotel. It's Strauss, the man whose work you translated. You know, for years, years and years, translating this work. And they had breakfast together, and neither of them could understand the other. So despite the fact that she had translated word by word all his German, and that, you know, they couldn't have breakfast chit-chat. And for me, that's really important in what do we mean by cosmopolitanism or being European. It's not erasing all differences. It's not smoothness. And I love some of Dell's work that she's you know, hasn't talked about here, but work about lace making and Nottingham loom makers and Jacquard and the complexity of that. And there's a beautiful loom in the Herbert that, you know, if you haven't seen, you must go and see. Coventry ribbon trade and its object and its textures is under that web. And it's full of, yes, it's an amazing thing when you look at these beautiful bits of silk, but it's got snags and knots that we don't see and, and things that have malfunctioned. And, you know, like, you know, someone buys some die that's rotten and it, you know, they make their money that way. She's really conscious of the, of the, 
the problematic nature of things. It's not smooth. We can make beautiful things, but, but at some cost. There are always knots and snags along the way. That's really important. And of course, there are many failures. Casalban has entirely failed from his adventures, adventures around the world of international ideas and literature and history. So things don't always work out. Yeah, but Casalban's problem is he can't read German according to Will. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yes, but he's... he's, he's um, yeah, I won't draw comparisons with contemporary, <laughs> with contemporary life, but yes, he's one of those scholars. <laughs> I don't read German either, I hasten to add, but at least I'll try and talk to people who can. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely moment for us to uh, open it up to questions, thoughts, reflections, webs, um, outside, inside, the rich, radical life of George Eliot. There were no mics for our audience that night. John Burton, no relation of mine, I hasten to add, from the George Eliot Fellowship, reflected that she lacked the profile that she deserved and asked us our thoughts on ways to preserve and raise it. One of the, the great ironies of this bicentenary year is George Eliot's one of so few of our national authors so esteemed without an author's birthplace museum or an author museum. The Brontes have got one, Hardy's got one, Dickens has got three, probably. Um, you know, the, the, so, so, and Scott... Um, and Eliot has not got one of these. There is, you know, there's amazing collections at the Herbert and at Nuneaton Museum and in the library and the fellowship do all their work. But, but to me, I wonder sometimes if that reflects that, that, that doubleness about place and placelessness in her work. That, you know, would she, would she, I hate to say this with you in the room, but would she want, would she, would she want a place to which she was attached when in a way she's saying, it's gone. Reading is the only way we can draw near each other or... or I'm, I was thinking about that, and that, she even says it. I mean, it's all, my, it's all it's nostalgic, it's half visionary, I've made it all up. I mean, is that partly because the industrial pace of life was so fast at that period that things really were disappearing and things would never be the same again? Or is it because she's looking back with such rose-tinted eyes on a world that never really existed? Oh, I don't think she's rose-tinted. I, yeah, I, I wouldn't say she's nostalgic in that way. I mean, yes, industrial change, and as Anna was reminding us in Silas Marna, Silas tries to go back to the town he came from, and it's... He can't find it. And it's an extraordinary moment, isn't it? It's just, it's all gone. There's no trace of, of Lantern Yard. I mean, so that's the world she's mm. writing about. But, but also, yeah, just this sense that, that she's not, she has a real go at um, Disraeli and his young conservatives, whatever they were called, young Englanders, a kind of nationalistic, romantic movement, who tried to, and she writes in one of her essays, who tried to restore feudalism as if they were growing prize cabbages by like an artificial manure of national sentiment. And it, she just skewers them. You know, you can't fake it. You can't pretend that we're going back to a jolly oldie worldy nostalgia. It's gone. It's gone. But we've got to find ways of, of, of keeping some things together. And, and what I think one of the things that, um, as, as a writer, when people talk about you know, people writing historical fiction, that um, I often think about, well, it's not just me, it's the thing that's said, is that, of course, you're not really writing about Tudor England or the Victorians or whatever. You're using that as a way to think about now. And I think that that although obviously there is there is that the, the doubleness that you talk about, where where Eliot's writing about that kind of recent past and it's a place you can't go back to, um, inevitably it's a comment on what's now as well, isn't it? It's that kind of you know it's 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 both and and I think that I mean you know if you're you know kind of live around here if you've like going to Birmingham I mean it's where I live it's changing every single day. I can't find the Birmingham that I used to go to like two weeks ago, <laughs> um, let alone when I was a child. Um, um, it's, it's changing very, very quickly. Um, but I think that, that for me, it's that kind of, it's, it's that the balance between that kind of acute sense of loss and longing um, and that kind of and it wasn't that great at the same time, you know. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't know. There's, you know, I, I absolutely loved the old Brutalist Library in Birmingham, and it was really ugly. Um, you know, both things can be true, um, but, but she does that obviously on a, on a kind of really profound level around, around kind of the societal stuff. And I think sometimes when we hear those little snippets, it's really easy to kind of think that there is this kind of sort of easy, I don't know, kind of uh, sort of pastoral soft tintedness. But it's that it's not there. <laughs> I don't think. I think it is that kind of. It's very gritty. But there is that kind of sadness woven into it as well. There was a question from the audience about Charles and Caroline Bray and their circle of friends who befriended Marianne Evans when she moved to Coventry. Coventry being a home of radical ideas, real game-changing ideas. You know, they were again relatively wealthy ribbon manufacturers in the time Elliot knew them. She lived next door to the Cashes of Cashes name tapes. You know, very recently departed Cashes name tapes. 
Um, so she's literally woven into that community. But they, but, but they, but they were, um, yeah, they were, they were hosting radical thinkers. Um, Hennel's inquiry into the nature of Christianity, I think, was, was hugely important for her. And it really interests me, some research I've been doing with my colleague Helen O'Neill recently, um, when Elliot did eventually marry when she was quite old after George Henry Lewis died, and that's when her brother wrote to her again when she became respectable and was married. Um, and after Elliot died, John Cross, her younger husband, much younger husband, started writing a biography, and he got the help of, a, uh, of Lord Acton, don't know who he is. But Lord Acton kept on writing to, to Cross saying, surely it's impossible. She came up with these extraordinary ideas, living in Coventry, without even having read any Kant or any 18th century literature, just reading, just talking to Charles Bray and Hennel, you know, resulted in this. And, and, and this what takes back to my argument. Yes, there was enough. There's enough. You know, with her and that context and, and that rich life, there was enough with mechanics institutes and visiting speakers and, you know, the, the, the agrarian innovations she grew up next to one of the first Newcomen engines, you know, there at the Arbury Hall estate where, you know, Sir Roger um, Newdigate had, had pushed through huge innovations in mining technology, agrarian technology that her father was very involved in as well. So, so to paint just outside Nuneaton as a, as a kind of desert of provincial life is it's just wrong. It's just wrong. She could do more in London. Um, and another letter I've just been reading at the Beinecke Library in Yale is just saying several years later when everyone was saying, no, George Eliot is that Marianne Evans, it's that Marianne Evans. Yet another letter's turned up saying, in Coventry, it is decidedly not underscored like four times the opinion it could possibly be Miss Evans, you know. <laughs> it's definitely this old man Liggins. Has the bicentenary um, and all the, the Gillian's piece and everything that's happening, the work you're doing, obviously it's leading to with the Herbert, has it, is, it, is it raising her profile? I mean, has she... Do you feel that she is finally getting the attention that she, that she deserves? I mean, is there a spirit in the air or is it all, is nothing changed? No, I'm just one of the, the things on my list is I'm revising an article I'm writing with Helen O'Neill, who's done most of the work, on comparing really the Elliot Bicentenary of what was done for Dickens in 2012. And it's so different and different for really interesting reasons. And Helen's done some great work where she's used... Um, a digital tool, Google Engrams, which sounds very dry, but she's looked at how, compared how Eliot and Dickens get quoted in other books in a massive corpus of texts. And she's shown that really in the literary sphere, Eliot and Dickens follow each other pretty well. That, that you know, in, in all the literary sources, it, it's not like one is more famous than the other or that David Copperfield gets re referenced more often than Mill on the Floss. But where she doesn't translate is, you know, and why I'm so glad about the film and the approach it has, she doesn't adapt. She doesn't adapt in the same way. There have been no new adaptations since Andrew Davis's ones, which are 20 years ago? No, maybe not 20 years ago, but a good time ago. And we had Andrew Davis speaking at one of the um, bicentenary events um, in London that some colleagues organised. <laughs> he was hilarious. I don't know if he's in the room. I don't think he's in the room. He's quite local. <laughs> Just keep a little glance around. Um, but he said, the problem with Elliot is you can't be free as a scriptwriter because that... Uh, you know, I think he actually said, though I may be making this up, the spirit was, that bloody woman keeps on coming in there when you've just read something great and telling you what to think about and telling you how to see it and she's just being too bloody clever and you can't write what you want to. Um, and, and, you know, th this sense of Elliot just being, you know, in there, imposing herself and, and, and uh, you know, and also she doesn't do very good endings. You know, we've talked about this. You don't have an ending, a satisfying ending where everyone comes together and hooray, wedding bells celebration, the baddies are punished and the goodies get off lightly. Apart from, as we discussed, Maggie Tulliver and the, and the flood and the, and the drowning, but that's pretty yeah. awful. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a celebratory wedding. Not really. Not um, really. Do, but do you think, I mean, do you agree with Andrew Davies? Do you think that is the reason? Is it the voice? Is it, is it because she imposes herself too actively on the text? I, I think it's because um, some novels can only be novels um, and because it's in the nature of the form. Well, one of the characteristics of the form is it, is it, is it does that interiority so well. Um, and, it's, and it can be about that exploration of consciousness and that thing that Elliot does so well of making you realise that every person is I to themselves and that, that they're not all objects, but they're all subjects in their own lives. Um, and that, 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 that the novel is so, such an amazing form for that. You can, you can be inhabiting one life, then another, then another, then another. And you it can't do that in the, film. The point that Martina was making about the mosaic. In fact, you've, you've all yeah. talked about it in some ways, the different worlds mm. and how they all slot mm. together in a way that's so intricate in the novel. Yeah. Well, and I, yeah. 
And what, what I was going to say about the about the um, everything is connected film is it, it does that really well because it isn't trying to. I mean, it's actually telling a story, isn't it? Obviously, it's a story of Elliot, um, but but it is it is it's it's not trying to do everything. And actually, even though we do have that the the, the thing about um, not trying to you know trying to stay to kind of like within a particular kind of like locale or field of care or whatever it might be, and not trying to talk about everything that that, that was in that in that quotation earlier on. Um, I think Elliot does try and do so much, so much, and you can't just do one bit of it in a TV adaptation. I mean, we all lose bits, don't we? we all, you know, no matter how much you know, you can love an adaptation, but it can still not be your version of the book that you've mm-hmm. read. But I think with Elliot, that's kind of magnified by a billion, you know. <laughs> yeah, and there's so much in there. And I think it is, you know, it is the the readly experience. And and the thing about you know the, the joy of working with Catherine and other people at the library and so on over the last year is trying to find ways of telling Elliot's story and making people connect. That con- connecting people with the life is really easy because it's a remarkable life and there should be a damn, a really sexy biopic of Elliot. You know, that's what we need, basically, because her life is amazing. But her, for me, as a literary critic, trying to communicate what she does as an artist to transform what the novel can do, what we think the novel can do, um, and what realism as a form, how, how a, a, a mode of any kind of art form can make you see the world in a different way is hugely important, and, and that's why, you know, Del and I hope to work together at some point on making a, a film that would use kind of contemporary, you know, Del's own artistic vision to convey something of Eliot's interest in attentiveness and realness, the everyday and connectedness as, as sort of themes to spring off from, because one thing I found really interesting, and, and I talk about a lot, is, is how George Eliot was a huge influence on Vincent van Gogh, and when we say realism, you might think, oh, gritty melodrama, black and white. But no, Eliot's about super saturated, Kodachrome colour yeah. and, and that kind of realism. And, and finding some way of conveying that would be great. Yeah, and I'm, I'm very struck by um, the rejection that she goes through, lots of different process, art processes that she talks about in the books, and she rejects them. So in Middlemarch, it's very striking that she rejects being a studio artist. So the artist must go out of the studio to do things. So that all the, the talk about the studio, the studio artists in, in, in Rome that, that, um, that are rejected by Ladislaw then to, to, to move outside is, is really interesting, I think. This idea that, the, and that, 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 that it can't, that's got to be more than the key to mythology, is more than a kind of enigma to be unraveled, but more than a studio practice in the sense of just forms to be figured. It needs to involve life. The conversation grew to a close at this point and we continued with music. Amy Kokora wrote a piece for us, especially for the evening at Warwick Art Centre, entitled Quiet Invisible, inspired by George Eliot's poem of the same name. She's recorded it for us for the Folk Podcast and we'll play it out in full at the end of the podcast. Um, in the meantime, here's a short sneak preview and then Ruth and I will catch up on the work we've been doing since the event on adapting Middlemarch. Listening back to the podcast, listening back to the recording of the uh, the cafe that we did oh, back in February, which just feels like a million years ago because of COVID, doesn't it? It's like another world. We ended up talking about why it was that there have been so few dramatizations of George Eliot's novels, and the conclusion at the time was, well, she's just impossible to dramatize, and I, I wondered if. If the process that we've been on over the last nine months has has shifted your thinking over that, is she possible to dramatise, do you think? Yeah, I, I, I do think Elliot's possible to dramatise. Uh, and um, it involves some careful thought about inside and, and outside. And, and I suppose that's why some of the process we've been doing is, is, is so fascinating um, as a literary critic to think about how you show what in George Eliot's book you're being told a lot, which is 
it, looking at the world through someone else's eyes and a lot of detail about how people perceive the world in profoundly different ways. So you become really enmeshed with someone's story from the inside out, even if on the outside they're quite an unlikable character. Um, and that is something that's really difficult to, to show, either in film or on stage. And it's really interesting in some of the research I, I did for this project with my, my colleague Helen O'Neill. Um, Helen looked at um, the history of adaptations of, of Eliot compared to, say, Dickens um, in the British Film Archive and uh, Dickens is the most adapted, famously, the most adapted author anywhere, you know, globally. It's astonishing how many adaptations and reworkings of Dickens' works there are from, you know, from Bollywood to, you know, traditional Japanese drama. We see it everywhere. Um, and Eliot, many, many fewer um, recordings and, and dramatizations of, of her work. Um, but actually, interestingly, I thought, well, let's let's throw someone else in the mix. Let's think about, say, um, Charlotte or Emily Bronte's work, who I think of as writers who are adapted and on TV or in film quite a lot. Um, but actually, there are more film adaptations um, and stage adaptations of Eliot's work than there are of the Brontes. But in the Brontes' case, it's the same novels that get made and remade over and over again. So they get a kind of... They're built up as these kind of quite thick documents of culture that, 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 if, that even if you've not read, say, Jane Eyre, and someone mentions a madwoman in the attic, or, um, you know, someone says Wuthering Heights, I mean, it might be Kate Bush that people come to in mind first, but there have been enough allusions and reworkings of those other stories that people feel they they know them and they come to them without necessarily that intimidation of baggage of, of not quite knowing what they're getting. Um, but yeah, Eliot's works are, are sometimes described as, as infamously hard to adapt because they because they are so focused on on the individual story, um, but 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 from the inside out, um, from you know that that sense of how a, a really careful thoughts about how two people's very different points of views may be changed by the worlds in which they find themselves and they may realise that they're just in the wrong place, they're born into the wrong world and they're not going to succeed in the way they thought they would. And that's the emotional drama. So it's that level of, of, of really quiet misery, in a way, uh, that Eliot does so well, as well as really quiet, ordinary happiness um, that's so moving when you're in the world of her books. But how we convey some of that quietness sometimes... Um, that that sense of the experience of life on the inside, on the stage or in a performance is is a really um, fascinating question. But it's one I think we've got quite far with, really. Yeah, I think I think we have too. I, I, my my sense is it's because uh, dash because we're using the model of our residences and we're thinking about the world, not just the kind of the the, the narrative of the the story and how that drama of the singular you know the singular drama which I'm not sure there is one in Middlemarch but not you know, let's say in the case of um, in Middlemarch with Bulstrode and the murder of Raffles we're not just thinking about that one storyline we're building a world we're building a, a community a town we're drawing on some of the the uh, was it over a hundred characters that you named characters that you identified in in Middlemarch as part 90, of this process so, yeah over ninety so. So we're, 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 we're kind of we, we, we're honouring that by building a community both through our actors but through all the participants we're going to work with and the audiences themselves and my sense is that is how we will do justice to this this idea that it is she is challenging to to, to, to bring to life because when we're, we're creating the community and the voice of Middlemarch not just as an individual but as a collective experience yeah so I think that's it I think it's thinking of Middlemarch as an experience more than a story and actually, um, that is, to me, really faithful to what Eliot tries to do in that novel. It's, it's, you know, it's not just one story. It's a whole multiple intertwined set of stories that all cast light slightly differently on all the different forms of experience. And, and the novel's structured in that way. So it's called, you know, um, you know, three love problems. And so these, these three sets of couples in unhappy relationships and then waiting for death, which counterposes two very different families who are waiting for the death and, uh, of a family member and, and what comes afterwards. So throughout the novel, it's, it's paired as, you know, how is one woman like or unlike another young woman who's on the verge of marriage? And so we're asked to, to compare our own situations to the to these other people we see in similar situations through the novel. And it really interests me that, that some of the practice we've, we've, we've done thinking about the, in that residency style where we'll be asking 
we'll be using our, our kind of um, facilitators, our middle people to to set those questions really to some of our audience members to say, well, what do you think about this? Do you think she should be marrying him? You know, is this is this Rosamond's best bet? Um, you know, sh- should she be marrying locally? Should she be aspiring to this to this fancy doctor? Or, you know, should we be shunning um, Lydgate because he's a bit of an outsider? Um, is this what Middlemarch is? And it's that question of what is Middlemarch? What's the experience of being in Middlemarch? Which I really hope will will give us something that's 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 faithful to the intent of the book and and has some of its major plot lines in there, but perhaps more than that is is truly faithful to what Eliot really thought a great work of art should do, which is sort of place you in the in the middle of things in the middle of an experience, so you're kind of swept away and immersed in it, but equally have these moments where you just are suddenly flung out of it and reminded this is all made up, but it still is yeah. true. And, and how does that make you feel? And so anything that yeah. can kind of capture that experience of a great work of art in whatever medium is, will, be, will be a great celebration of that novel, I think. I I'm completely agree with you. I loved uh, I loved being in the rehearsal room. I mean, partly I love being in the rehearsal room because we're living through we're living through such a lonely experience in the pandemic, and to literally be in a room with some actors, even if we were socially distant, and to have the experience of playing with the text and messing around, taking the the uh, the novel and trying to turn it into direct speech and improvising with it was really joyful. It was a lovely experience for me to lead. Um, I also particularly love uncovering all the extra characters like you know I, I i was thinking particularly of is it oh gosh plimdale uh what's his first name ned um, ned, Master plimdale. Plim- ned, plimdale. ned plimdale ned plimdale and how our alice our actor just found this enormous humor in ned he was brilliantly funny he stole every scene he was in and he really is a bit part in the book um and he will continue to be a like a lesser character in our version of the story but to to bring that lightness and actually to bring the humor enabling our middle people to bring the humor in to the piece is just really very exciting and will add texture and tone to the story which is very exciting yeah yeah, and I think it's I think it's great you know there there was there was George Eliot's written an essay called I think it's called something like German wit and um and it's always this sort of cliche it's like oh my gosh George Eliot the least funny woman in the world writing about German wit you know what what kind of a cliche you know and actually but but and people kind of make jokes about how unfunny George Eliot is but actually you know do working with the actors has really shown that there is that variety of tone um and 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 gesture and and that her dialogue is actually really great sometimes as well that that we think of Elliot as 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 uh, you know as a writer as as one who's got this great heavy narratorial presence and that's one of the reasons why she's often been considered as hard to adapt because the narrator steps in and tells you what you should be thinking but actually the the way we've been working with the actors has made it increasingly clear to me that that a, what a lot of very recent um critical work on on Eliot's fiction has has shown is absolutely true which is there are lots of moments where in the past people have said that's a narrator telling us what to think but actually it's much more subtle than that we're kind of sliding along into actually hearing the internal conversations of a character and those were some of the richest places we we found material to to kind of rework as dialogue or monologue um, for some of our actors particularly moments where you, you know Dr Lydgate who so often is is only seen in these quite uncomfortable semi-public situations or in the private torment of his marriage actually had space to reflect on on who he was sometimes he's not a very self-knowing character um despite being you know very privileged in many ways um there are not many moments where he he truly understands himself he actually the narrator's often telling us he misunderstands himself and and it's great to get those moments you know into direct speech by Ligate to kind of bring that character mm. out to the audience I think as well and what I think is absolutely lovely about that is that you see your very point about the audience is that it will be the it will be the audience that enable that to happen that's so exciting that it's not it's it's a two-way experience it will be because of the audiences playing being part of Middlemarch and that will enable will draw it out of Lydgate otherwise he wouldn't be sharing them um so we need we really need our audience in the room to bring to life this vision that we're that we're creating with our with, with Middlemarch yeah and 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 the you know the novel is called after the the town which of course itself is a very lightly fictionalized version of the Coventry that George Eliot um, you know, went to school in and had some really formative years in her 20s as well, a good decade. Um, and it's that funny sense that, that um, 
you know, Middlemarch is, is kind of every town, and that's certainly what Lydgate says in this really dismissive way. The kind of language you'd still hear, well, pretty much every small provincial town's the same, isn't it? And you just think, gosh, what an intake of breath if you just sort of said, well, Coventry is just the same as, you know, Leicester or Bedford, really, isn't it? And you just think, oh, you know, the kind of the arrogance with which he kind of lets that slip in his first dinner party with the mayor and the mayor's daughter, um, you know, so proud of their town. Um, and 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 then and yet Middlemarch is also and then so the novelist sometimes says yes it's just a study of provincial life any provincial life but there are moments where we know historically this is so completely Coventry in exactly these years in the early 19th century with its silk ribbon trade with its you know slightly corrupt local politics with its really massive kind of political riots whenever it was election day with the geography of the town and the country um, it's it's all there it's all there although by this stage in her career Elliot was a bit more tactful about hiding uh, about not you know so directly drawing from life um to, to sort of it's a, it's a lovely segue to talk about the other element which which we discussed uh, nine months ago at the cafe which is this the, the the issue of of the outsider because what is wonderful about Lydgate yes he's incredibly pompous and he says all the wrong things but um uh, Lydgate is, is the outsider and he, we've we've talked a lot in the rehearsal process about how this doctor being the outsider it, it's very much you know he was an outsider in the 19th century but we've talked a lot about the possibility of him of that um of, of, of how how we how that story continues to be so relevant today, the prejudice and the scepticism and the um, uh, the gossip that happens to you know that happened that revolves in communities around people who who don't you know were not from around here. And what was really wonderful for me in the rehearsal process when we when we were all together was to watch Bally go through that process with Lydgate. So Bally, who himself, I guess his family are not originally from the UK, um, from way back, thinks of himself as a as a proud Coventrian, um, really found found something in that, in that when you know when we were when we were working with Lydgate as a uh, Lydgate's final scene when we put it on will be the moment when he accuses the town of 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 of, 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 of effectively continuing to make him an outcast and 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 suddenly Bally it meant something very deeply emotional it was very emotional for him to work through that process of going I understand that I understand the prejudice and and I I like it was a great moment for me for many reasons artistically it was great but also to see the continual resonance and relevance of George Eliot today uh, and not it's, she's not just stuck in the 19th century these issues pervade everything today it, it, it was just an absolute hair on the back of the neck moment wasn't it Josephine and, and, and made me you know as a, as a text-based person completely understand the value of, of of working with actors and improvisational techniques to get us closer to that that spirit and to see that moment of connection for Bally uh, that then animated the whole delivery of that text um yeah, amazing that the issue of the outsider is always there with Elliot. And, you know, so much of, you know, her stories are about those who, you know, we think of the great stories of the world, I suppose, you know, from the Odyssey onwards, or who knows about the people who leave home, people who leave home and go out into the world and have adventures and then maybe eventually sail home again, you know, safely and are accepted back in their communities. Um, so much of Eliot's storytelling is it turns that on its head, I think, quite purposely. So, you know, in Silas Marner, for example, is this absolutely the story of a, a migrant outsider with a strange religion and a bit useful to the community because he's got a skill, but viewed with huge suspicion um, uh, for all kinds of, you, you know, religious, ableist, um, all kinds of discriminatory reasons, who eventually finds his way into the community. Middlemarch kind of plays something rather differently, which is yeah about Lydgate, who is the the other kind of you know the skilled migrant, but a skilled a skilled migrant um, who who just is never going to be accepted by that community. And it's interesting because in the text, that's because of what are called in a, in a way his spots of commonness. So so that he's just kind of imperfect. He he doesn't know how to ingratiate himself across classes. I mean you you, you know Ros Rosamond was always complaining about him being too eccentric that he doesn't want to fit in enough. And I think the vision of Middlemarch is, is, in that sense, it's that doubleness of community we have in the story of Middlemarch. Community is something that can make you feel at home, that is held together by gossip and fun and um, a sense of mutual support and family interrelationships over generations that create this really rich social world we see flourishing in Mrs Vincey's living room in, in, in our thinking of how we're going to make it to realise it. Um, 
but community is also something that that can very quickly close ranks and you know gossip can knit people together gossip can also as we see in the in the story as it plays out um be completely damaging and 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 you know lead to terrible things like um Oh, I can't even remember. Mrs. Taft and her knitting we were talking about. There's a very minor character called Mrs. Taft who, who's knitting the whole time and she um, often catches hold of, of, of half-heard bits of gossip and kind of incorporates it into her knitting. So you have these stories um, such as the suspicion that Lydgate is actually the banker Bulstrode's illegitimate son, which is not true at all, but actually is kind of half true in relation to another bit of the story. Um, and and it's, it, it's that sense that... Community is always a really double-edged, a double-edged thing. Something that can make you feel part of something, but something that can utterly exclude you as well. And we see that. I, I, I think our what we're doing with our audience members and with the middle people should utterly kind of dramatise that experience of being the insider and the outsider, or being asked to be a bystander who's part of the shunning as well. Um, uh, yeah. I, as a final question, Ruth. Would you say that the, the, our work together has shifted anything in your understanding of George Eliot and Middlemarch uh, over the last nine months? Would you say that looking back um, now, back to that, that, back to that podcast, <laughs> I keep saying that, back to the cafe that we <laughs> that we produced in live the old days, in, in the real old days life, of liveness, with yeah. all, audiences in the room well, and all that, um, uh, that, have things shifted for you since then? In the day, from the days when I wore shoes to do <laughs> to do to talk to you, <laughs> yes, um, yes, they have in in all kinds of ways. What could I put my finger on? One would be understanding the importance of language to me, which I know shouldn't be a surprise given that I'm a prof of English literature. But but that in that that the world of Eliot is. It, the, the the language she uses is important as well. That's something that was completely improvisational, and just recast the story completely in a modern vein. Um, which there is a great kind of um, uh, YouTube series I think that does just wouldn't quite do give us the experience that we were after. Um, and that you know her dialogue is there to be used and reused and adapted in some ways. But the, her dialogue is is strong and and great, and and that's really important to me. Um, but also really heartening in the sense that an author who I'd long thought of, you, you know, I, I'd kind of almost despaired of, of, of thinking of seeing an adaptation of her work that would break out of the kind of heritage corset teacups vein, um, could actually be something so dynamic and so connected to the the major questions we're facing now. I mean, one thing we, we stumbled across together is the the importance of the moment of quarantine in the story um for accelerating the relationship between Rosamond and Lydgate and until we were in lockdown and talking about this a lot um as with, with you know other dash collaborators um i i don't we'd only started be, to begin to think about all the physical rituals around distancing and health protections and quarantines that 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 make a kind of strange bodily courtship dance um and and that that was certainly um there and something that we could play with uh, when we were working with the actors as well so you know the world has changed and, and Middlemarch is one of those great works of art that, that changes as you age it changes as the world changes and now for the first time I suppose I'm seeing parts of it as a kind of a, a quarantine story and how relationships accelerate um, when a world is going through this moment of extreme change. I hope we've given you a taste of George Eliot and managed to share some of our love for her writing and excitement for adapting it. You can find out more info on our plots and plans for the Great Middlemarch Mystery in Coventry on our website, including a forthcoming Big Give campaign to build support for our middle people drama workshops in and around Coventry. Huge thanks to Ruth, Anna, Riddell and Martina for our female-powered conversation on Mary Ann Evans, a.k.a. George Eliot, and to Warwick Arts Centre for hosting our cafe, to Royal Holloway for their support, and finally to Amy Kakora for her beautiful music. We'll play out the recording with some of the music from the evening. The team behind the Dash Arts podcast is me, Josephine Burton, Christina Catalina and Natalie Beach. You can find more episodes wherever you get your podcast or by going to our podcast section on our website, dasharts.org.uk. If you like the Dash Arts podcast, follow the show, share and please leave us a review. It helps us stay visible and would mean the world to us. I'm Josephine Burton, back in a fortnight with more conversations at the Dash Arts podcast. Thank you for listening. And may I grow in spaces liminal between the credences that bear a pain. Oh, may I touch the soul
discord quenched by pleasing harmonies where courage hides in bullish solitude would I spin ringing webs of pharmacy a cup of strength in some Hey.